So I want to show you the trip in. So we get there to the airstrip. We're in the twin honor. We, we switch to the. So here we are, the, air, the helicopter taking off from the airstrip and the concentration of, of houses to go deeper into the forest, a little higher up, a little further away from the uh, concentrated uh, concentration of Hewa houses, uh, going back down as a twin rod of the Karatasi, and we're going to go up uh, higher into the hills. The one thing that you notice when you're flying over a tropical forest is how many colors of green there are. Uh, um, the, the, each species of tree tends to have a slightly different color of green in its leaves. And a tropical forest can have hundreds of species of trees in not a very big area. So you really notice this beautiful mosaic of different colors of green. So we're still in a fairly disturbed area of the forest. It's going to jump in a little bit to a little deeper in where it's a little bit less disturbed. This is my first helicopter ride. I'm so, <laughs> so you'll notice the mountains, they tend to be in this region of Papua New Guinea, sort of 2,500 meters or so high. There are regions where it's up to 4,000 or more. Um, uh, here we're coming towards the camp. You'll notice the, the blue tarps on the temporary structures that were built for us. Uh, so that's where we're going to camp uh, and work out of there. The beautiful rivers. <laughs> so you'll notice that where we're landing is a clearing. They did not clear this for us. This had been a garden. So a family had lived here. Uh, they tended the, the, the garden, and they, uh, they eventually left, and it started to grow back. But it's not too far grown back, so it's probably only a couple of years since they were there. OK, so we land. I'm just thrilled. Like, I just can't wait to get out of the helicopter and start looking for spiders. Uh, this is our uh, camp, home sweet home, for about two weeks or so. Um, uh, and you'll notice in the middle of it, so you'll see the, 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 there were a group of Hewa that lived with us and, and helped collect and helped organize things and so forth. Uh, you'll notice in the middle of it a strange thing, which is one of these. Uh, and I'll show you now what, uh, why it was there. Uh, this is one of my prime uh, collecting methods. Uh, spiders are everywhere in the forest. You have to know how to find them. They're hard to find just looking at them. But if you go and you shake vegetation, many of them will fall out. They're on the sheet. They're easy to see, easy to pick up. So um, uh, I uh, looked to see if anything fell on the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> to a spider, those big green leaves that I was just shaking are a different habitat than these dead leaves that I'm shaking right now. And that's a different habitat than, for instance, this tree trunk here. Unless I just saw a spider, I got a little tube. I, Chase, I convince it it wants to go into the tube. I uh, put the cork back on and stick it in the other pocket and continue. Uh, so this is this work where I'm going right now is a different habitat again, a mossy tree trunk. Every one of these little sorts of microhabitats could have different species of spider that are specialized for it. The world is a very big place for a spider. Okay, so that's what I do with this thing. In in uh, in Spanish, I call it a kite. Otherwise, I call it a beating sheet. Okay, um, they're not just in the vegetation. That way you can also look for them on the ground, such as ones hopping there, on tree trunks, and so forth. So you look in lots of different places and see what you find. The, this site was, was uh, excellent for providing a basic cross-section of the New Guinea fauna. Each one of these jumping spiders, these are all jumping spiders, uh, uh, and I'll tell you how you recognize a jumping spider in a little bit. Uh, each one of these is a classic New Guinea group that uh, most three of the groups are only known from the New Guinea region, uh, and I was so thrilled to see them finally, because I'd never been to New Guinea before. But remember, I'm taking you to the most heart pounding, adrenaline pumping moment, so I, I can't lose that thread. Uh, and so, after being there for several days, we decided to walk up about two hours in, along a muddy trail to a higher elevation forest. It was absolutely spectacular, beautiful, and pristine. It was a wonderful place. The birds were singing all the time. It was just amazing. Uh, and it was a, a karst area, limestone, beautiful sinkholes, truly a spectacular place. Here's our temporary camp with island in the background there. Um, and there, uh, I started to notice that there are these pandanus uh, uh, plants, which are a little bit like an agave or a, or a yucca to us. They're rather nasty with spines, and so you have to avoid getting too much blood all over everywhere when you go to try to collect around them. 
uh, my own blood, that is. Uh, but I put the beating sheet, this thing, underneath the edge and the accumulated litter in the base, I pulled forward and shook. And when I did that, I found this little beast, a little brown spider. Uh, and when I first saw it, I didn't think too much of it. There are a lot of little brown spiders in the world that are hard to recognize unless you get a microscope out and compare it to the literature. But there was something about this one that I thought, gee, you know, this thing just looks sort of weird in some ways. Like, I knew I didn't know what it was, but I also thought there's something that bothers me about this that means it might be a really interesting one, but I really couldn't tell. So I went back down to the lower camp, uh, uh, dealt with the specimens, prepared them, photographed them as I do, and this is what these guys look like. Uh, fairly mundane little looking uh, little brown spiders. But, uh, and here's the most heart pounding adrenaline pumping moment. I looked under the microscope. I took a, this is a little bit of a spider. I'm not, I'll tell you later what bit it is, but it's a little bit of the spider. I looked, I took it off, so this spider is preserved. Uh, I looked more carefully at it, and I noticed this thing on there. And it was a median apophysis. <laughs> And I just want to leave this slide up for a moment to let this all sink into all of it. This thing had a median apophysis. So you just reacted pretty much the way that my colleagues did. Uh, I tried as hard as I could to explain to them how amazingly wonderful this median apophysis was. I was gushing and everything. I mostly just got these sort of, you know, one raised eyebrow or something like that. And these are, these are certified biodiversity geeks I was with. If there's anybody that could appreciate something like this, I thought it would be them. Now, I could just therefore give up. Like, if I can't explain it to these people, obviously it would be a little easier to an Eric Nolts, but if I couldn't explain it to these people, I should just give up, right? But I decided to take it as my task to explain it to you. And, and, and so I hope the next bit of the talk while I'm explaining it will sort of go smoothly, but we'll see. And I, and I want you to appreciate a median apophysis eventually. But I want to go now talking in general about how did I get there in the first place? Uh, why did I go to Papua New Guinea? And why was I so excited by a median apothesis? And it all started when I was an early teenager on the shores of Lake Ontario. I was down by the shore, a, a clump of grass that had been cut from a neighboring property. Uh, I was floating by, uh, and on it, as if on a life raft, was uh, this jumping spider. And she looked up at me. And of course, at that point, I had to save her. Uh, uh, and so uh, I got her, uh, and she was fascinating. I was really interested in this little creature, uh, and not just because she looked up at me. And it made me, that summer, decide to try to see what other jumping spiders I could find. How, ma how many different sorts of these things are there? What are they like? Is, it just, is there only this one sort that I found? And so the way it expressed itself in me, this interest, was by drawing them. I wanted to somehow capture their beauty or, or celebrate it, but also my understanding of it through drawing. So uh, in 1972, uh, uh, the earliest drawings that I still have are these two. I can actually recognize what species they are, which is uh, sort of remarkable given how crude they are. But by seven years later, I managed to, to improve a fair bit my ability to represent uh, these organisms. Um, and this is about the peak of my ability with respect to jumping spider illustration, because it eventually gave way to more technical styles, uh, uh, as shown on the top in 1986, where I was looking at the little bits of the spider and, and details uh, thereof. Uh, and then, towards the bottom, it gave way to lessening and lessening patience as the years went on. So the drawings got spare, and that's sadly the way it is nowadays. So, um, but my, my, my attention to these spiders, and my fascination with their diversity and the details uh, arose out of a number of things. I think I'm just generally interested in diversity. But there are a couple of things that are really special about jumping spiders that attracted my attention, at least. And so what is so special about jumping spiders? One of the first things you notice are the eyes. So most spiders, if you look at like that, don't have eyes like that. Uh, and so when you look at a jumping spider, you'll see those four big eyes up front, especially the two middle ones. And if you were to cut away the head, uh, uh, you'd see something like this. Uh, cut away the surface of the head, you'd see a fairly big brain, and connected to it on the top are eight eyes. So most spiders have eight eyes. Jumping spiders are no exception. Um, but what's special about the jumping spider eyes are those two big ones up front, and in particular the fact that they're not simple spherical eyes like ours, or like the, eye, the other six eyes, but they're these long tubular things. So these, um, these 
big eyes here, long tubular things with a strip-shaped retina that scans the environment side to side. The back of the retina moves. Um, and this is an amazing solution to get a very high resolution visual system in a really tiny place. It's, it's difficult to make visual systems really small because of the trade-offs of uh, photorecepting, uh, photorecepting uh, capability and uh, focal length and so forth. But they've done an amazing job. And it's said that these eyes are the highest resolution eyes among the animals except for the vertebrates, where we lie, and the cephalopod mollusks where the octopus and squid.